Hello! In the previous video, we explored how to compute propagation delay through a given circuit made of logic gates. In this video, we will extend that idea to compute total delay through multiple logic circuit devices, such as this 2-bit adder schematic here. We'll discuss a couple different approaches. The first one is what I'm calling the sure way, and I put that in quotes because of all the assumptions built into our analysis. This sure way is to break down the given devices into their component gates and then do a gate-by-gate -gate analysis, just like the previous video. Each of these full adder devices contains the same gate layout of two exclusive ORs, two ANDs, and one OR. The carry-out bit of the first adder serves as the carry in to the next adder. So there is a wire connecting them down here. The assumed delays through each gate are written on the schematic. Then we work upstream to downstream, adding the largest starting delay to the delay through each gate. On the left, 0 plus 20 yields 20 nanoseconds. Below that, 0 plus 10 yields 10 nanoseconds. In the next exclusive OR gate, the largest starting delay is 20, and we add 20 more through the gate, yielding 40 nanoseconds. Similarly, the AND gate output is computed from its starting 20 plus 10 through the gate for 30 nanoseconds. The OR gate is computed as 30 plus 15 for 45 nanoseconds. These results are identical to what we saw last video. And the process is no different moving forward. This top XOR gate has a starting delay of 0, and we add 20 through the gate for a total of 20 nanoseconds. Note the assumption here that all inputs to the adder, from A0 through B1, arrive at the same starting time. Similarly, this OR gate has a delay of 10 nanoseconds. This next XOR gate is where we really see the compounding delays of devices placed in series. The starting delay is 45 nanoseconds, taken from the C out signal. Adding that to 20 yields 65 nanoseconds. Similarly, this AND gate starts at 45 and 10 is added to it, yielding 55 nanoseconds. Finally, this OR gate's largest input delay is 55. Add that to 15 and we get 70 nanoseconds. The overall delay of this 2-bit adder is the largest output delay, which is 70 nanoseconds. This next approach I'm calling the mostly good way. It will give us the same results as the slower gate approach just covered for this particular example. But there are cases where it may be an oversimplification. This approach goes more quickly since we look at the device level schematic rather than the gates. First, we need to know the delays from each input to each output within the device. Notice this table here. It is computed from the gate level circuit as follows. The longest path for input A to reach output S is 20 plus 20 or 40 nanoseconds. Thus, we write 40 for input A reaching output S. The longest sum from A to C out is 20 plus 10 plus 15, or 45 nanoseconds. And we see that result listed on the table. It turns out that inputs A and B are identical to each other in wiring, and so their delays are the same. Input CN to S only passes through this single gate, so that delay is 20 nanoseconds. Finally, CN to C out passes through this AND gate and OR gate for a delay of 25 nanoseconds. As a check, note that the longest delay on the table is 45 nanoseconds, which matches the overall delay for a full adder computed in the last video. This table is now our legend as we focus on the device level schematic. How long does it take for a signal to pass from these inputs to output S? It is the largest number in the S column, or 40 nanoseconds. 
How long does it take for a signal to pass from these inputs to C out? It is the largest number in the C out column, or 45 nanoseconds. The next device is the trickier one. Here we must consider the largest total of starting plus through delay from each of the inputs. For output S, input A1 has a starting delay of 0 plus a through delay of 40 for a total of 40. Input B1 is the same. Cn, however, has a starting delay of 45 plus a through delay of 20 for a total of 65. This value is larger than the A1 or B1 totals, therefore the delay here is 65 nanoseconds. Similarly, the largest total delay for the C out is 70 nanoseconds, computed from Cn's starting delay of 45 plus its through delay of 25. Comparing these three output signals, we take the largest number as the total delay, so 70 nanoseconds. The nice thing about this approach is that it can be extended to larger and larger cascading adders. Here we see a 4-bit example. We can reuse the table for each device's delay. The least significant full adder has delays of 40 and 45 nanoseconds for S and C out, respectively. In the next device, the largest total delay comes from CN's starting 45 plus 20 into S and 25 into C out. The totals are thus 65 and 70. In the next device, the largest total delay comes from CN starting 70 plus 20 into S and 25 into C out. The totals are thus 90 and 95. Note that we do need to consider the possibility of inputs A or B taking longer, but in this example, their total delays of 40 or 45 are much smaller than CN's starting delay. In the final device, the largest total delay comes from CN starting 95 plus 20 into S and 25 into C out. The totals are thus 115 and 120. The total delay before we can be confident in this 4-bit adder's output is 120 nanoseconds. That approach is a nice back-of-the-envelope calculation, but there are numerous assumptions built into it. If we care about knowing exact performance characteristics for any real circuit, the real way is through empirical measurements. Build the circuit, test it, and record your results. And then, if you build another identical circuit, expect that your results will be a little bit different. That's the nature of working with real machines. What is the point of computing total propagation delay? Perhaps the biggest reason is to tell us the maximum allowable clock frequency for a computer system. We'll discuss clocks much more in our upcoming sequential circuit lessons. For now, it is sufficient to know that on every clock cycle, a computer's processor updates values and performs new calculations. We need to run the clock slow enough so that all connected devices are guaranteed to have the correct values before the next tick. We also need to know the connection between period and frequency. These are direct functions of each other. For any cyclical event, like a clock's tick-tock or a swinging pendulum, if you know the period, you also know the frequency. Period, abbreviated with a capital T for time, is a measure of how long one cycle takes. Because of this, it has units of time, like seconds or nanoseconds. Frequency, or little f, is a measure of how quickly a cycle repeats. Its units are one over time. One over a second is the definition of a hertz. Let's say I'm pushing Charlotte on the swing, and she is rocking back and forth like a pendulum. The time it takes from one push to the next is four seconds. That is the period. We could also say that she completes one over four cycles per second. That's the same as 0.25 hertz. That is the frequency. Since we know the period, we can compute the frequency by simply computing 1 over the period. 
Let's assume that the 4-bit adder is the slowest device my computer's processor is connected to. What is the maximum allowable frequency? The first step in answering this is to identify the largest propagation delay. We found that to be 120 nanoseconds. Next, we compute the frequency from that period. 1 over 120 nanoseconds means 1 over 120 times 10 to the negative 9 seconds. This is equivalent to 1 over 120 multiplied by 10 to the positive 9 hertz. 1 over 120 equals 0 0.0083. 10 to the 9th power is replaced by the metric prefix giga. So, the result is 0 0.0083 gigahertz. Finally, we choose a clock frequency that is no higher than the computed frequency. Here, I round it down from 0 0.0083 to 0 0.008 gigahertz. Then, I converted the metric prefix to make it easier to read as 8 megahertz. This wraps up our lessons on propagation delays. I have found that many students don't like these lessons because they make circuits seem messy after having been trained on nice, clean binary values and logic operations. But the real world is not convenient. These sorts of considerations often make the difference between a machine failing or functioning.